If you put the, the uh, 36 raised to the 1 half power in your calculator, it looks like this if you have the new operating system. If you have the old operating system, when you type it in, it has to look like this. Notice that the exponent's in parentheses. You find out that the answer is 6. Well, that's kind of interesting, because the square root of 36 is also 6. Maybe that means that raising something to the 1 half power and square rooting it are exactly the same thing, which they are. There's a property about something called rational exponents that tells us if you raise something to a fractional power, then the denominator of that fractional power is the root index. So for example, if you said a to the 1 half power, that's the same thing as the square root of a, because remember for square root, the root index is 2, even though we don't write it, it's that implied 2. The, or a to the 1 third is the same thing as the cubed root of a, and a to the 1 fourth is the same as the fourth root of a. Now, I'm going to make this one step more difficult. What if instead the fraction has something other than 1 in the numerator? Now what happens if you want to rewrite that exponent in radical form? Well, the denominator is always the root index. The numerator, however, is an exponent. And there are actually two ways of writing it. One of them, notice that the exponent is under the radical, and the other one, it's outside the radical. Both of these actually lead to the same answer via their particular order of operations. Um, but a lot of times we end up just writing the exponent under the radical, which is fine. So in other words, if I said a to the 3 halves, that would be the same as the square root of a to the 3rd. And if I said a to the 5 sixth power, that would be the same as the 6th root of a to the 5th, or the 6th root of a all raised to the 5th. Now let's look at a problem involving rational exponents. I want to find the simplified form of each expression. Now, given the fact that our graphing calculators are a lot more modern these days and can actually do these three problems without any work involved, I would like to look at these three particular expressions simplifying it in the long way. The reason I want to use the long way is because as soon as I put variables into these expressions, you can't just simply put it into your calculator to simplify it. So instead, I'm going to look at 216 to the 1 3rd power as the cubed root of 216. Well, it turns out that 216 is really just 6 cubed, because if you do the cube root of 216 in your calculator, you end up getting 6. For 7 to the 1 half times 7 to the 1 half, I'm going to start by rewriting both of those in radical form. So it's the square root of 7 times the square root of 7. Well, now that I have them in radical form, I know I can multiply them because they have the same root index. So I get the square root of 49, which just happens to be 7. In part C, I'm going to start by rewriting this as the 4th root of 5 times the 4th root of 125. Now I'm going to multiply them together because they have the same root index. I'm going to get the 4th root of 625. And it turns out that the answer is just 5 because 625 is the same as 5 to the 4th. Whenever the root index and the exponent are the same, they end up just canceling each other out. Now let's talk about converting between exponential and radical form. This is going to help us with solving of some equations. So in problem A, 
what is x to the 3 sevenths in radical form. This is called exponential form because it has an exponent. Radical form means we're going to rewrite it so it has a radical. The denominator of the rational root, or the rational exponent, always tells me the root index. The numerator is always an exponent. So you can either write it this way as the seventh root of x cubed, or you can write it as the seventh root of x in parentheses cubed. Part b. What is y to the negative 3.5 in radical form? Well, notice that when we talk about rational exponents, we're talking about fractions. So we want to rewrite negative 3.5 as a fraction. Well, it turns out that it's negative 7 halves. So this is going to be the same thing as the square root of y to the negative 7th. We don't like negative exponents, so remember that we can write this as 1 over y to the 7th. All right, now for the fun part. I'm going to do a little bit more work because we don't like radicals in the denominators of fractions. So I want to get rid of the square root of y to the seventh in the denominator. In order to do that, I need the exponent of y to be something even because I want it to be divisible by 2. So if only it were y to the eighth, in other words, if only I had one more y, I could get rid of the radical in the denominator. So now I've got the square root of y on top and the square root of y to the eighth on the bottom. And we learned earlier that what we can do to get rid of that radical in the denominator is I can divide the exponent by the root index. So 8 divided by 2 is 4. So it turns out that this is the same as the square root of y divided by y to the fourth. Now let's go the other direction, where I start with something that's in radical form, because it's got a radical, and I want to rewrite it in exponential form. Well, since it's a square root, that means the root index is 2, and that means the denominator of my rational exponent must be 2, and 5 is an exponent, so it goes in my numerator, so it's a to the 5 halves. In d, the fifth root of b to the third is just b to the 3 fifths. Let's do a practical application of a, an equation that has a rational exponent in it. Kepler's third law of orbital motion shows how you can approximate the period p in Earth years. It takes a planet to complete one orbit of the sun. Use the function p equals d raised to the 3 halves power, where d is the distance from the planet to the sun, in astronomical units. AU is the abbreviation for astronomical units, and it's equivalent to about 93 million miles, or the distance from Earth to the sun. How many years does it take Mars to orbit the sun? If the astronomical unit for Mars is 1.52. Well, all we have to do is plug 1.52 in for d into that equation because we just said that d is the distance in astronomical units. Well, now all you have to do is plug this into your calculator. Remember to raise to the 3 halves power. If you don't have the new operating system, then the 3 halves power has to go into parentheses. And you should find out that it's about 1.87. Now let's go back and determine what were the units for p. Well, the units for p was in Earth years. So that means it takes Mars 1.87 Earth years to revolve around the Sun. Now the next question is, does that make sense? Well, I hope it does, because if you think about how the planets work, here's the Sun, and then the first planet is Mercury, the next planet is Venus, the next planet is Earth, we're always the third rock from the Sun, and after Earth is Mars. So if it takes Earth one year to get around the Sun, 
then it should probably take Mars a little bit longer. And it does. It takes approximately 1.87 years for Mars to get around the Earth. I mean Sun. <laughs>